രണ്ട് പുസ്തകങ്ങളുടെ പ്രകാശനമാണ് ഒന്ന് രവീന്ദ്രൻ തന്നെ രചിച്ച സ്വപ്ന ചാതുരങ്ങളിൽ രണ്ടാമത്തേത് ഖാര്യക്കലി രചിച്ച ന്യൂ വേൾഡ് ഡിസോർഡർ ഈ പുസ്തകങ്ങൾ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തുന്നത് മാങ്ങാട് രത്നാകരനാണ് ഈ പുസ്തകങ്ങളുടെ പ്രകാശനം നിർവഹിക്കുന്നത് ഐജാസ് അഹമ്മദാണ് ഇത് സ്വീകരിക്കുന്നത് ഇ എം രാധയും ശ്രീ രവീന്ദ്രന്റെ പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട ചന്ദ്രികയും ശ്രീ മാങ്ങാട് രത്നാകരൻ ചന്ദ്രികയാണ് 
Mr. Shkuma, Chairman of Limited Foundation, Milan Producer Saidas Ahmed. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our main speaker in this event, Professor Ajaz Ahmed, who is a public intellectual of great standing and stature. He has taught in universities in the US, India and Canada. In New Delhi, where he resides now, he has been a professorial fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. He has also held the Rajiv Gandhi Chair at the Jawaharlal Nehru University and the Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan Chair at Jamia Millia. Currently, he is on the editorial board of the Delhi-based publishing house Left Word and is a senior editorial consultant for the news magazine Frontline where his political essays appear frequently. His analytic and theoretical work appears in a range of journals like Social Scientist, New Left Review, Race and Class, Social Regis Socialist Register, and so on. He writes in English, Urdu, and less often, Hindi. His writings are frequently translated into other Indian languages, as well as languages such as Turkish, Portuguese, Korean, French, Chinese, and Arabic. Some of his books in English are Ghazals of Ghalib, In Theory, Classes, Nations, Literatures, Lineages of the Present, Globalization and Culture, Offensives of the Far Right, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Imperialism of Our Times, published in 2004. His current work in progress is provisionally titled In Our Time, Empire, Politics, Culture. He is also edited a reader, a kind of anthology of articles on political Islam, to be co-published in 2015 by the Columbia University Press in the US, in the US and the Tulika Books in India. <coughs> Later this year, he will be teaching as a distinguished professor of critical theory and comparative literature at the University of California, Irvine. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ajaz Hamad. <coughs> Comrades and friends, it's a very great <clears throat> honor for me to be in invited to give this lecture <clears throat> in memory of uh, Chintaravi, who started for me as a Ryoma, became a legend, but I never met him. And language barriers being what they are, I'm not directly, personally, <clears throat> familiar with his work. But I know him only, as I said, as a legend and as somebody who has had the honor of friendship so wide that I keep hearing of more and more people and meeting more and more people who are his friends. And it's a, Wonderful thing that many of his friends came together and established this trust <clears throat> in his memory. I also speak with some degree of trepidation uh, <clears throat> because I'm quite aware of the others who have given this memorial lecture before me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it so happens that all three are very good friends of mine. Uh, <laughs> Prabhat and Appeal and uh, Tarek. I just saw some of Tarek's speech in the Lokans. Uh, mine is a very different kind of paper. And there are a couple of things I'd like to share with you about it before I start presenting it. 
One is that uh, uh, <coughs> Sashi referred to my lecture yesterday. Uh, and uh, this is the same lecture. Those who heard it would be very surprised to know, but apprehended philosophically. Yesterday it was a political analysis, it's a different mode of thinking about the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> today it will be in some um, sections hard going. Um, and the way it came about is that sometime last year, October or November, something like that, I became convinced that Mr. Modi was going to be elected. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm very... I'm, I'm, I'm turning it off in a second. Yeah, I'm saying that I became convinced that Mr. Modi was going to get elected. I thought that the word fascism will fly around. I thought that among many liberals, there would be a tendency that since he has been elected, we should give respect to him as a duly elected Prime Minister. And that it would be very difficult for us to actually comprehend what is happening. So I started a text, which in my mind is simply called Jottings. Some of those Jottings I have published in an article. A couple of those Jottings I read out today also. So far there are 30, 30 some. I'm going to read 12. Uh, it's very much, if you are, those of you who are familiar, in the mode of Adorno's Minima Moralia, although not so dense philosophically, which is to think of politics philosophically. What in politics we call revolution, philosophically you can say negativity. Only the dishonest live in the positive. The honest live in negativity. <clears throat> and that certainly refers to how you live with liberal democracy. Uh, so she also referred to the manifesto and uh, Marx's take on democracy. I, have, I actually have three jottings already on Lenin and Marx, um, but I'm not going to read them. One I dropped actually this morning uh, that I was going to read about Lenin. Um, long and short in my view is that democracy in its day of infancy and adolescent vigor in the time of Marx. Today it is in I. <coughs> Senility and old age is set in. Uh, <clears throat> all right, here it goes. Liberalism is quintessentially Anglo American. No wonder then the two centuries or most or more. First the British and then the American Empire have ensured that liberal democracy would come to be seen eventually as the ultimate horizon of all democratic thought. Uh, this has been particularly the case since the collapse of the Soviet system and with that the dashing of all hopes that the actually existing Socialism could itself be transformed in such a way that liberty and equality may eventually come to coincide. <clears throat> we, of course, know the sort of democracy and the sort of capitalism liberal democracy is doing that dawned in all parts of the former Soviet bloc. But that was not the only consequence. There was also a more generalized dimming of colors. 
Michel Foucault was to observe, revolution has been the horizon of all modern politics. With the horizon disappearing, it is difficult to see what politics would now mean. If you don't work towards a revolution, what is politics? Michel Foucault asks. Fukuyama's end of history disquisition inverted the sense of loss into a celebration. History had finally found its vocation and its terminus in the global final triumph of liberal democracy. In short, democracy itself would now be the revolution once had been. Ultimate content of political desire. <clears throat> we also witness the consequences, for instance, in the narrowing of horizons within which the finest of the insurgent thought in the recent Arab rebellions was able to think of itself. A million people in Tahir Square every day for 18 days with the famous slogan, people want to overthrow the regime. One slogan, million people, 18 days, primary slogan. It simply meant end of dictatorship, dawn of democracy. In short, elections. Countless people were willing to die for what the Americans call regime change. Thousands did die across the Arab world. Elaine Badiou, the philosopher, gave the event a name, the rebirth of history. When <clears throat> rebirth of liberal democracy in Egypt, the Arab, Arab heartland, gifted the parliament and the presidency to the Muslim Brotherhood, an extraordinarily broad coalition of forces, including perhaps the great majority of the Tahrir revolutionaries, took refuge under the umbrella of a coup d'etat. John Kelly, the US Secretary of State, described the coup as restoration of democracy. General Sisi, chief coup maker, then proceeded to get himself elected to a new presidency. Kelly again expressed satisfaction as further restoration of democracy. Democracy and dictatorship are the two signs, sometimes indistinguishable, that shape so much of the modern political discourse. In this pairing, democracy seems to self-evidently mean liberal democracy. This is the real triumph of liberal democracy, obliteration of all else that the world has ever meant. <clears throat> Number two. Democracy is one of humanity's oldest aspirations, but one that has caused much fear and loathing in some of the greatest minds. Consequently, democracy has not had an easy time of it through its long, long history. Herodotus, the classical Greek historian, was equally fearful of what he called insolence of a despot and insolence of the unbridled commonality. Unbridled here is the operative word, the idea that the commonality had to be bridled, guided, tutored by the elect <clears throat> has ancient origins. And it is this idea of a bridled democracy that eventually takes hold of the bourgeois imagination in the form of liberal, representative, electoral democracy. <clears throat> there are also other accents in this discourse. <clears throat> Thucydides, the great, the other great historian in Greek antiquity, would appear to be very close to the modern liberal idea of democracy as the opposite of dictatorship. 
All that is opposed to despotic power, he says, has the name of democracy. <coughs> in his treatment on, in his book, Politics, however, Aristotle draws the line not on the issue of despotism, but on property. In a famous maxim, and I quote Aristotle, an oligarchy is said to be that in which the few and the wealthy, and democracy that in which the many and the poor are invested with the power of the state. The distinction between democracy and oligarchy. The opposite of democracy would then be not dictatorship, but oligarchy. And the central issue would be not political despotism, but the institution of private property. <clears throat> this is the accent that Rousseau picks up in his discourse on inequality when he poses the question, is property compatible with equality? <clears throat> this line of thought leads he eventually to Lenin's formulation, democracy, yes, but for which class? Plato, the teacher of Aristotle, goes part of the way with his equally famous student, perceives class war to be a central feature of democracy, but also requires an idea of revolution, putting his fears in the mouth of his own teacher, Socrates, who notes in the Republic that every city consists really of, and I quote, two cities that are at war with each other. He then goes on to say, democracy comes into being, this is the Republic, Plato's Republic. Democracy comes into being after the poor have conquered their opponents, slaughtering some, and banishing others, while the remainder they give equal share of freedom and power. This is democracy. Democracy comes into being after the poor have conquered their opponents, slaughtering some and banishing some, while the remainder they give equal share of freedom and power. No wonder then that democracy comes rather low in Plato's classification of state forms, well below aristocracy and oligarchy. But sounded to us like a revolution creates much sense of fear in Plato. And he says democracy is much worse than oligarchy, which is worse than aristocracy. The solution obviously is that democracy be redefined in terms of professional politics. <clears throat> A good decision is based on knowledge and not on numbers, Plato says. And he would then go on to define statesmanship as a professional calling and an expert art. <clears throat> Perhaps lies the seed of the emergence of a professional politician in liberal democracies of today. <clears throat> Fear of the multitude thus has its opposite, the cult of expertise. Thus, Alexander Hamilton, one of the recognized founding fathers of the United States, was to write on the eve of the American Revolution, when the deliberative or the judicial powers are vested wholly or partly in the collective body of the people, you must expect error, confusion, and instability. He recommended instead delegation of authority to selected few. <clears throat> this is the man who wrote most of the conventions of uh, the Bill of Rights in the United States. These are the origins of liberal democracy. By and large, and right into the 20th century, 
Most kinds of dominant Anglo-American thought tended to view democracy as a very risky affair. <clears throat> Raging against it as a perfect foil for revolution, popular insurrection, and with the fear already expressed in Plato that the poor would simply slaughter or banish some of the wealthy and impose equality on the others. Precisely because both are variants of the capitalist, technocratic, oligarchic state. Uh, <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is Adorno and Horkheimer and others, um, that uh, uh, liberal democracy and fascism actually has, have but much more in common. And they're writing it during the period of Nazi Germany, as exiles from Nazi Germany. And that once capital had been expropriated in the USSR, what defeated popular democracy was neither the rise of a new capitalist class, nor even the personal dictatorship of Stalin, but the bureaucratic character of the Soviet state. The so-called cult of personality was, was simply the mask necessary for that bureaucratic rule. <clears throat> Oligarchy, dominion of property over labor, wage slavery, permanent bureaucratic authority hidden behind electoral rituals, not personal dictatorship, have been historically understood as deep structures that negate democratic possibility. <clears throat> By the same token, therefore, the question of democracy in this tradition of thought was associated with the abolition of oligarchy power, emancipation of labor, and redistribution of bureaucratized functions of the state among masses of people and their popular organs. <clears throat> Liberal democracy's preoccupation with dictatorship and what it called totalitarianism got shaped in a particular context. When challenged, challenges rose to it, both from the left in the shape of communism, as well as the right in Nazi and fascist forms. The structural reasons for the rise of Nazism could be best suppressed, and the emancipatory logic of the Bolshevik Revolution could be best denied if figures of Hitler and Stalin could be made to appear as men, men of the same fiber. Both of them dictators, both psychopaths, and both incarnations of pure evil. That's the liberal democratic discourse. Uh, Hitler and Stalin are the two names of great evil in the 20th century. Furthermore, both antagonists, the fascist and the communist, could then be tarred with the same brush of totalitarianism. It is only in the era of the current unipolar US hegemony when even social democratic theory has itself become the subordinate half-sister of liberal democracy that large sections of the communist left came to view apparatuses and routines of the capitalist state, elections, parliaments, etc., as democracy per se. No doubt, as an ideological reflex produced by the defeat of the Soviet Union. It is in this circumstance of the defeat of the socialist project that liberal democracy arises as a universalized desire. <clears throat> Across the political spectrum, just as national, <coughs> sorry, just as neoliberal globalization abolishes the very idea of national economy, democracy promotion abolishes the very idea of national sovereignty. All, mar all markets can be opened up, all countries invaded in the name of the one or the other. Commodity fetishism and democracy fetishism are, in our time, two faces of what I call capitalist universality. <clears throat> Number six. What about democracy in its imperial home? 
Voluminous commentary is easily available on the issue. One of the more recent I have read is by Wendy Brown, so I'll quote her at some length. And it will really be at some length. <coughs> First quotation. Democracy has historically unparalleled global popularity today, yet has never been more conceptually footloose and substantively hollow. Like Barack Obama, it is an empty signifier to which any and all can attach their dreams and hopes. Or perhaps capitalism, modern democracy is non-identical birth twin and always the more robust and wily of the two, has finally reduced democracy to a brand. A late modern twist on commodity fetishism that wholly severs a product's saleable image from its content. Berlusconi and Bush, Derrida and Baribar, Italian communists and Hamas, we are all Democrats now, but what is left of democracy? <clears throat> A bit later, she answers her own question. And again, this is even a longer quotation. It is not simply a matter of corporate wealth buying or being politicians and overtly contouring domestic and foreign policy, nor of corporatized media that makes a mockery of informed public or accountable power. More than intersecting, major democracies feature a merging of corporate and state power, extensively outsourced state functions ranging from schools to prisons to militaries, investment bankers and CEOs as ministers and cabinet secretaries, states as non-governing owners of incomprehensibly large portion of finance capital, and above all, state power unapologetically harnessed to the project of capital accumulation via tax, environmental, <coughs> environmental uh, degradation, energy, labor, social, fixer, fiscal and monetary policy, as well as an endless stream of direct supports and bailouts of all sectors of capital. Uh, 16 trillion dollars were given to U.S. banks by the U.S. government between uh, 2008 and 2012 as a bailout to stabilize them. 16 trillion of people's tax dollars handed out by the state to the banks. Um, democracy is most important if, if superficial icon, free elections, have become circuses of marketing and management. It is not only candidates who are packaged by public relations experts more familiar with brand promulgation, so also are political policies and agendas sold as consumer rather than political goods. What can democratic rule mean if the economy is un unharnessed by the political yet dominates it? Yet what could be more a fantasy than the notion of subordinating a global capitalist economy and its shaping of social, political, cultural, and ecological life to democratic political rule. Perhaps democracy, like liberation, could only ever materialize as protest, and especially today, ought to be formally demoted from a form of governance to a policy of resistance. I shall offer only two quick comments after so lengthy a quotation. First, when Professor Brown speaks of merger between corporate power and state power in today's democracies, she is implicitly recalling Mussolini's defiance of a definition of fascism as a system in which government and corporations become one. <clears throat> the point, however, is not that we are living under fascism. But Mussolini said, was 
the characteristic feature of fascism, where corporations and government become one, has happened. But the point is not <clears throat> that we are now living under fascism. The point is that what was once thought to be a specific feature of fascism is now taken for granted in liberal democracy itself. Second, she of course limits her remarks to conditions now prevailing in the advanced Euro-American zones. It is well to recognize that these symptoms are, if anything, more extreme in the more backward zones of capital under dictatorships as much as in liberal democracies, as even a superficial reading of Indian newspapers would testify. <clears throat> Wendy Brown is right. Democracy is a brand, a contentless fetish, usable for all and sundry. The democratically elected government of the Muslim Brotherhood collected billions of dollars from Amir of Qatar to institutionalize their brand of democracy in Egypt. The subsequent regime that arose out of the military coup and got itself legitimized through another set of elections, went on then to collect even larger sums of money from kings and sheikhs of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and UAE. Um, $12 billion in the very first day, actually. Um, <clears throat> to the satisfaction of US Secretary of State, John Kerry, who celebrated, celebrates all such restorations of democracy. These same people are busy restoring democracy in Syria through the agency of hundreds of Islamic militias and crime gangs funded by sundry Gulf monarchies, again to the satisfaction of Mr. Kerry. Yes, we are all Democrats now. Sheikhs and monarchs, Egyptian generals, French paratroopers, secular intellectuals, NDTV, CNN, Al-Qaeda militants, Narendra Modi, the list is endless. We are all Democrats. <clears throat> Number seven. The three classics home of liberal democracy, the homes of the three great bourgeois revolutions, the three countries whose constitutions are the very models for constitution making wherever liberal democracy obtains in the tri-continent, namely Britain, France, and the United States, have also been, logically, the three main colonialist and imperialist powers in the past and the present. <clears throat> Among all the advanced capitalist countries, Britain and the United States have had the most impressive imperialist record, the most uninterrupted histories of liberal democracy, but also the weakest of communist movements. By contrast, the European countries that succumbed to Nazism, fascism, and military dictatorship, mainly Germany, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, were the countries that had either lost great empires, such as Spain and Portugal, or countries that had tried and failed to build great empires of their own, such as Germany and Italy. But all four were countries with massive working class revolutionary movements that liberal democracy was unable to contain. <clears throat> Germany was a special case it had produced the most splendid philosophers of revolution and democracy, and it had surpassed Britain in industrial production by the end of the 19th century. But it failed to make a revolutionary breakthrough, even though it had the largest working class movement in Europe. Fascism did its job. The working class movements were destroyed through mass murder, and all four countries came after an, inter inter after an interval of Nazi fascist dictatorships came into the liberal fold sooner or later. Meanwhile, two world war wars were fought to determine whether Germany or the United States would inherit the British 
and the empire, French empires, hence inherit the world. At the end of the Second World War, the liberal democratic United States in fact achieved what Nazi Germany had sought but failed to achieve, universal domination and global empire. When, <clears throat> once it became the global capitalist hegemon, it also be became the great model and promoter of liberal democracy. William Brown, an American historian, estimates that roughly 50 million people have died in wars that the US and its allies have unleashed since the Second World War. Around the Third World. Let us therefore pose a question and leave it at that. Why is it that the three primary homes of liberal democracy, Britain, France, and the United States, can kill and maim innumerably more people in the name of democracy and civilization than the Nazis could ever manage? And yet, be considered the very epitome of civilization, while the German bid for a similar sort of empire can be dismissed as an act of pure barbarity, even pure evil. What is the unique crime of fascism that liberal democracy has not committed? <clears throat> as the his history of slaveholding constitutionalism in the United States shows liberal democracy in its much celebrated Jeffersonian version could happily coexist with slavery and in the Civil War and with racial segregation for almost another hundred years right into the middle of the 20th century. Apartheid South Africa modeled its Bantu stance very much on the American reservations of the Native American survivors of genocide, <clears throat> just as contemporary Israeli democracy is modeled on the racialized democracy of the United States, as well as the South African apartheid. And as the history of the suffragist movement would show, those who spoke in the name of the Magna Carta, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Bill of Rights, were through most of their history remarkably unwilling to allow women to have the simplest, the emptiest of all the democratic rights, namely the right to vote. <clears throat> there have always been the few who have had abundant recourse to the fruits of democracy, but the very existence of that democracy has always rested on vast underbellies of undemocracy. The great slogan of the Occupy movement we are the 99% points precisely to that fundamentally oligarchic nature of capitalist democracy. But that is not the story liberal, liberal democracy tells about itself. <clears throat> the consequence and necessary and inevitable consequence of the con <coughs> number nine. Uh, sorry, I have not been telling you that. I'm jumping from one jotting to the next. Uh, <clears throat> the consequence, necessary and inevitable consequence, of the contraction and defeat of communism has not been a triumph of democracy, as, it, as is commonly supposed, but further decayed. <laughs> the US state was distinctly more liberal and more invested in defending the New Deal under Kennedy and Johnson than it is under Obama. Kennedy said, if we, if we don't support a peaceful revolution, we will make violent revolution inevitable. In other words, in Kennedy's view, capital could fight communism more effectively if liberal democracy learned to be much more democratic than it had ever been. European social democracy was a practical realization of this thought. <clears throat> 
give as much of the value added back to the worker in the form of personal and social wage as possible if you want to prevent communism coming to Europe. <clears throat> With communism defeated, Obama works under no such compulsion. He therefore serves the corporations much more wholeheartedly and creates a far more authoritarian state than even Nixon could have ever dared to do. In Western Europe, social democracy lost its reason for existence after the retreat of communism within Western countries and eventual defeat of it in the Soviet and southeastern zones of Europe. Not only did it surrender itself to liberal democracy, social democracy itself became a tool in that neoliberal corporate capture of government whose only function is to facilitate massive transfer of wealth upwards from the poor to the rich. Communism may be accused of all sorts of things, but the idea that defeat of communism would somehow give us more democracy is at best a fantastic idea. <clears throat> Number 10. The proper function of the much abused concept of post-colonialism is to insist on how very deeply and extensively colonial structures continue to live a life of power and domination within the polities that have become independent of colonial rule. <clears throat> Terms like neo-colonialism and imperialism refer for the most part to domination from the outset. For instance, the power of transnational finance capital over the fragile economies of Asia and Africa. Post-colonial, by contrast, refers to the persistence of the structures that were introduced into these countries to serve colonial rule and now serve the new indigenous ruling class and its overlords among the externally located, located ruling classes of the capitalist system as a whole. The post-colonial state does not only come after the colonial state, it also inherits the colonial. Proudly inherits, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> now, I have reservations about many aspects of Ranjit Guha's work, but I think he's correct in asserting that there was not a single leader of any stature in the anti-colonial movement who was substantially free of the habits of British liberal thought. Nationalist leaders swam in the ocean of liberal thought like fish in water. And the leader in question may be Gandhi or Nehru or Adhupadacharya or whoever else. <clears throat> Gandhi was a barrister as well as a reader of Carlyle, Thoreau and Tolstoy. He played the whole gamut of modern law, religious piety, non-violent civil disobedience, prison terms, and infinite negotiations with the media always at hand and the British could never get out of the circle because the game was played by rules of liberalism itself. He counseled class compromise to workers and capitalists and caste compromise to lower and upper castes. Because he had learned his political moderation as much from British liberalism as from Hindu conservatism. Thoreau and Tolstoy, <clears throat> his genius was that he could so easily translate the grammar of politics he had learned from Thoreau and Tolstoy into the Indian idiom of the self-sacrificing Sant and Rishi, taking everything from modern secularism to Bhagavad Gita in his stride. <clears throat> We see a very different variant of this in the great vacillations in the thought of Ambedkar, who was uncompromisingly radical and oppositional on the issue of caste, and yet, simultaneously, a man very much in the mold of Anglo-Saxon liberal constitutionalism, as attached to his suits, as Nehru was to his Sherwanis, and Gandhi to his iconography of asceticism. <clears throat> the issue of caste gave an insurrectionary edge 
to Ambedkar's thought and occasionally drove him into sympathy with Marxism, which then offended his liberalism. Not to speak of his perception that in Indian society, caste had priority over class. At the end of the day, what he wanted was a casteless, socially inclusive, constitutionally liberal, parliamentary democracy. He resented property because most property was owned by the upper caste. The contradiction between property and democracy was as foreign to his thought as to that of any decent British liberal. <clears throat> About Nehru one need not say much, except for some minor adventures into radical sentiment during his overly famous red years. He was by and large a very familiar kind of left liberal whose British equivalent would be the Fabian Socialist. Now, in these times of neoliberalism and of Narendra Modi, there's a great nostalgia for the Nehru years. Like most kinds of nostalgia, this too has some basis in fact, but thrives on exaggerating the facts. To put matters in, in perspective, it is best to call that what Nehru called the socialistic development of Indian society gave us much less of a social state than, was, than what neighboring Sri Lanka attempted in the very early years of its independence. And that any number of third world leaders of that time, Nasser, Nkrumah, and even Nairali in Africa alone, were probably more radical in their thinking and in what they attempted in their own respective circumstances. And I might add that circumstances for them were far more unfavorable. <clears throat> in the whole of our nationalist movement, there is no one comparable to African thinkers like Emile Carcabrad or Franz Fanon. <clears throat> 